Hi, everyone. Um, thanks so much for joining us. My name, um, for those of you uh, that I haven't had the pleasure of meeting, is Chris Brazier. I'm the group event director of a trade show called Commercial Kitchen. Um, and one of the great things about uh, what we've done is that we've been able to work with wonderful people like the Burnt Chef Project, um, who are talking about really important things that affect all of us. Um, but of course, in their case, specifically chefs. Um, so today I just wanted to welcome you, say thanks so much for being here. Um, it's really important more than ever that we interact all the time, but certainly while we're here on this webinar, if we can all interact, that would be absolutely amazing. There are some polls that will be going um, on. They are completely anonymous. So please feel free to join in with those polls. There is um, also obviously a chat box here. If you've got any questions or wanna make any comments, we'd love to hear from you. And most importantly, um, after this uh, really, really important, insightful uh, 20, 25 minute interview that you're gonna see with, now with Chris Hall, the founder of the Burnt Chef Project, um, there'll be a live Q&A with Chris, um, and of course, also with one of our leading chefs, with Adam Simmons. So I hope you'll stick around um, and ask any questions and get involved with that. But until then, please enjoy the video. Yeah, well, the Burnt Chef Project is a, a non-profit uh, clothing awareness training business, basically, that's due, designed to, not revolutionise, but designed to guide the industry in terms of the conversations of mental health and tackling mental health stigma. Um, it was born purely on the basis that I'd worked in the industry for just up, coming up 12 years now. Uh, and many of my friends who are chefs and front of house staff and general managers had experienced mental health issues and it was always quite curious to me but it wasn't until I was in my late 20s when I had like um, call it a personality crisis and I had to go get cognitive behavioral therapy for it and I did so completely off my own back completely under the radar like with shame because I felt like it was this big dirty secret and then from then on, I don't know, things just sort of clicked into place. I just felt like it was my duty to try and raise some awareness for this particular subject matter. I wanted to provide uh, open conversation, but also at the same time try and pay for fund, it, and fund training so that people can become more aware of the subject matter and that we can provide tangible skill sets and tools to both individuals and management teams on how to address this. The thing for me was the fact that I'd had loads of mates who had done 80 hour weeks, you know, they were done literally seven, eight, nine, ten 10 days in a row and all of a sudden they go off with a, you know, a bad back or some, a bad knees or, you know, there was something going on at home. But it became apparent that sometimes those weren't always the reasons why people were going off. And when I started taking photos to try and raise a bit of awareness for, for mental health issues within the industry and just generally raise awareness for mental health overall, I was getting met with a lot of resistance. There was a huge amount of friends of mine who I couldn't get to take their photo. They would, as soon as you said to them, look, can I have your photo for mental health and to raise awareness? They were like, no, don't want anything to do with it. And there was this, there was this interesting culture whereby this particular subject matter wasn't discussed. So for me, that was like a red rag to a ball. You know, obviously there was something that needed addressing. It was causing issues where people were having to take time off work and then say that it wasn't necessarily for mental health issues. Um, and that was it. I was just set on my path to try and make sure that people knew that it was okay to have mental health issues and how basically to look after themselves and how to discuss it with their employers and, and get a guided way out of that really. The thing is, it's difficult to put a finger on any one thing. I mean, when we look at the stigma around mental health and well-being, if you type into Google, like, mental health stigma, you'll see, you know, kings back in the 18th century having their demons exercised. You'll see, you know, straight jackets and electric shock treatment and all of this other stuff going on. And there's no wonder why when we talk about the subject of mental health, which is something that we all have, like physical health, that all of a sudden we get a little bit panicked about this subject matter and we don't really want to engage with it. That's on a society level. That's just as a, as a human race. I think that that's, a, that's really quite a, a problem. But then again, when you look at the hospitality industry, you know, we tend to work in 
close-knit teams, you know, it's a great vibrant industry full of creative and diverse people. With that, you tend to breed a culture of not wanting to let other people down. You don't want to be that weak link and let someone else then have to do extra hours to cover you. And so with that, we sort of suppress any problems. If it's a physical or mental health issue, we don't tend to want to discuss it because we don't want to be that seen as that weak link. But actually, long term, what you're doing is then impacting the overall effectiveness of your team because you're all not firing at 100% because you haven't had that, that break and that time to recover. I think it's, uh, it's a 50-50 split between individuals and employers. I think what we have to recognise within the hospitality industry is that it is tough. You know, we do tend to work longer hours um, for lower pay in some cases as well. And it's a very difficult one for us to be able to say that employers have to make the change themselves because most businesses are operating on a 2 or 3% net profit margin. It's very difficult to pay more from an empty pot. But what we need to start looking at is that individuals take responsibility for their own mental health and their own well-being and they're also encouraged to be able to speak up and say that they have a mental health issue or that they might be struggling so that then the employer can step in with the right toolkit and say well this is the reasonable adjustments that we can make for you this is how we can start to balance your work life you know and how we can design rotors to fit around the needs of yourself whilst also fulfilling the needs of the business and that's where the conversation piece comes in. It, and it is a very much a 50-50 split because if people aren't willing to help themselves and people aren't, uh, you know, aren't able to be able to put their hand up and have a conversation about something that's quite taboo, then it will mean that ultimately the employer is not able to do anything to help. And again, there needs to be a lot more education around what employers can do to make changes and to make that easier on, on their staff. Yeah, I think so. I mean, again, with mental health, if you've got a broken arm, you can see it. You know it's there. You know that it's causing you issues. It's visible to everyone else around you. So adjustments can be made in order to be able to cope with that particular issue. With mental health, it's not something that you can see and touch. Again, you know, it's a big taboo because you don't want to have a conversation necessarily about mental health because you feel that it might make the situation worse or you don't know the severity of it. So by building a framework, with regards to policies, it allows then employers to be able to say, well, this is the, what, we ha what happens within regards to uh, any is health issue, but mental health as well. This is the sort of procedure that we follow that's fair on the employer and also the employee. So it's a good starting point. But it's also about you know, educating employers as well. And we've got a management training program that we're, we're rolling out currently which actually provides teams with the skill sets that they need in order to be able to interview correctly. So get the right person for the job, irrespective of where they are on the mental health continuum, but also how we deal with absences, you know, how we encourage people to talk openly, how we use performance reviews as a positive and also a development tool as well. And it's about building the skill sets because what we have to address in this industry is there's a skill, skill set shortage at this moment in time. You know, people are moving through roles so quickly that we don't actually have any management training at this moment in time and we're trying to fill that so that people are more confident about engaging in this subject matter. Yeah, I mean, as with all policies, you have to continually review the effectiveness on them because if your policy is not effective and it's not working, there's no point in having it. It's a wasted piece of paper and it's a waste of time and resources. And it's the same with things like stress audits as well. You know, again, big thing that people don't know about within this particular industry, or not often, but the HSC have designed stress audits whereby you can actually rate the level of stress on the business and you can um, put in, again, criteria of how you deal with different stress levels. So things like that and to be able to rate the efficiency of it, make sure that they're actually working and make sure that the improvements are working. I think those are, the, those are the key things. Again, if it's just put in place, hoping that it magically does something, you're gonna be disappointed. One hundred percent. I mean, what we're looking at at this current moment in time is a huge resource crisis. And we're just about to, in fact, today we've closed a survey to try and find out exactly why people have left the industry, what we can do in order to get them back, and how the people who are left in the industry feel. Um, I think that looking at those, those statistics and those data, that data would be very interesting. But the key thing is that ultimately we're struggling for staff. 
And when we look at the reasons why, just generally, we are struggling for staff at this moment in time, it's because of the work-life balance, it's because of the wages. And I think overall, it's the impact of people's mental health and overall well-being that's causing people to take perhaps a shift and look at other industries. So in order for us to be able to run more profitable businesses within this industry, to be able to run more effectively and to have happier and healthier teams, we need to be looking at an overall cultural shift with how hospitality is run. Yeah, it has definitely changed. I mean, initially we set up to address this very problem before COVID had started. You know, we could see that this was, or I could see that this was going to be the case. And the whole purpose of the Burnt Chef project was to make sure that people who are in the industry felt happier and comfortable to stay in for longer. And we could encourage youngsters and the future of the generation of this industry to come in and consider it a viable choice for employment. So we always set out with the goal to make long-term sustainable changes within the industry in terms of culture and how businesses operate. COVID then came in and it meant that we were doing more triage. You know, we were trying to get to the people who were being affected by the, the whole pandemic um, and making sure that they were okay and that their teams were provided with the right tools to be able to look after themselves whilst they're off. Now we're back again. Again, we are under, under resource. That's putting additional loads on those who are, are there we're back to where we were initially when we started in October 2019. But now we've got a much more pressing issue. You know, if it wasn't for COVID, we probably could have gone on for another four or five years like we were. But now it's more imminent. And now we actually have to look at like all systems change. How do we bring in a new hospitality 2.0 where perhaps we don't look at the old ways of doing things. We look to other industries to try and work out where we can develop. have to be costly you know the simple one would be making sure that when your staff finish at 11 they're not then starting a shift at half seven in the morning you know and they're getting at least 11 hours off because if you run that sort of system and you run that for any period of time you're going to notice start cracks starting to show another thing is that on our days off we're always expected to be contactable or to come into work to help we can't keep our stress levels that high on a continual basis if you work 10 days and now all of a sudden you've got two days off you're being called into work or contacted by work and expected to reply again you're not going to get that time off to recuperate that your body and your brain needs in order to be able to be efficient when you come back so these sort of things are very simple to implement they're very you know again they can be written into a mental health policy they don't cost anything it just requires a little bit of thought and forward planning other things include, you know, making sure that people can get two days off, making sure that rotors are actually written perhaps not just the day before or the week before, but trying to plan rotors three or four weeks in advance. A lot of people have said to me that that's actually really difficult and it's impossible to do within hospitality. But there are businesses that we work with who have actually put in rotors three months in advance. And again, we're trying to build training materials and training modules so that we can say to people, look, this is how this works. It may not have been done the way that you've done it before, but it works, it's efficient, and businesses that have operated just the rotor system change have seen a dramatic increase in their retention rates. Yeah, I mean, I think what you have to realize, and this is why I think this subject is so difficult to tackle and it's not been done up until recently, is because there is no one size fits all. Every single business will have its own unique challenges and every individual within that business will experience their own unique challenges as well, whether it be with physical health, mental health, financial matters, whatever it might be. So it's very difficult to say blanket cover, this is what was gonna work for everyone. So a husband and wife team, you know, working in the middle of nowhere may be different to a, a multi-site organization working in the center of London due to being able to pull resources in and, and utilize um, the location geographically that they're in and also budgets. So. Just being mindful of making some of the changes I've already suggested, such as the road to changes, not contacting people on their days off, is the first key. But I think the big crux of it is, is that when it's costing between 3,000 to 5,000 pounds per person to recruit, train, set up on payroll, you know, cover all wastage costs, all of this cost, it's cost about 5,000 pounds per person in order to do that. Perhaps where we need to be looking is it not the quick fixes, but how we recruit in the right way, how we make sure the person's the right fit for the job, how they're upskilled well enough as well. And yes, it might take a little bit more time and it might cost us a little bit more in the short term. But overall, if we retain that member of staff for two, three, four years, 
that's only a one-off cost. Whereas at the moment we have some businesses who are operating anywhere between 75 to 130% turnover rate within the course of the year. Now if you've got 100 members of staff in a large organization turning over say 100 members of staff in one year or 120 members of staff in one year then that's going to cost you £5,000 per member of staff. You can quite clearly see how the profit margins are going. And the same applies also, if not more so, to the smaller businesses because it's going to be harder for them to recruit and, and to make sure that that cost is covered. So getting the right person, setting the right structures in place now will save you a lot of hassle and a lot of cost later on. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, there'll be, there'll be certain organisations out there who want to get involved in the subject and don't know where to start. And the Burnt Chef project is a great addition to any business model because it works with HR teams if you have them or works with the business owners to reinforce the message that firstly, it's okay to talk about your mental health and well-being. And then ancillary, we provide the services needed to be able to upskill those management teams, operational teams, business owners in what next steps that they need to take in order to be able to engage in this subject matter. But also, as I say, you know, the big impact to, to our health and well-being is the culture and the way in which the businesses are run. And there's no easy fix for it, but ultimately we want to be able to provide a whole wealth of resources that actually mean that anyone can pick that up and go, if I implement these two or three things, it's going to have an overall benefit to my staff, lessening the impact over to their well-being and their health. So that's the goal. So I think we're, you, you're always met with resistance in this, uh, in this industry because you know, the term, terminology which I come across a, a lot and I love, I love it because it's a good challenge is the industry is the way it is, it will never change. There's no point in you doing anything, it will never change. And you know, I, I've come to blows with people over the past, friends of mine who have said that to me and you know, here we are today trying to make a change long term. One of the big things that we came up with in the early days was great, you know, you're creating awareness around the subject matter. It's awesome that, you know, people are feeling more comfortable to talk about their mental health now. Now we've got eight members of staff who are disclosing that they've got mental health issues. What are, we, what are, what are you going to do about it? Like looking at the Burnt Chef project for a result. So from there, it's this sort of interaction and feedback that allows us to be able to put in steps to actually help. So from that was born the Burnt Chef support service. So it means that any individual who wants to talk openly about their mental health and well-being can do so free 24 hours a day using our free text-based support system. And unlike an EAP, you're not waiting to get a response. You can literally text Burnt Chef to 85258 and you'll have a trained volunteer text you back within five minutes and they're overseen by clinical psychologists. And all of a sudden then you are having an open conversation about your mental health and well-being and they'll signpost you to additional sources such as the partnership we've just put in place with the Drinks Trust, which also then now provides free counselling via a telephone uh, system and also free managerial advice, free debt advice, free marital <coughs> advice. So we're really bolstering the support that we're offering to individuals and also management teams. With that then, again, we're getting a lot of people you know, turn around to us and say, great, now you're supporting the individuals, but you know, what about us? Like, what about the management teams? How can we then like, develop ourselves in order to be able to address this particular issue? So that's where the Burnt Chef Academy comes into play. It's building the training modules and providing them to free for the industry you know, at, at quite a significant cost. But we feel it's necessary for the long-term sustainability of this industry to be able to have training modules on effective communication, on men managing mental health in the workplace, mental health awareness, stress resilience, nutrition, you know, all of these really key fundamental pieces that allow individuals and management teams to start to learn more about this subject matter so that they're a little bit more confident moving in. Moving forward, there's a lot more that we can do. Um, building peer support networks is, is next on our agenda. We're working quite closely with colleges as well. So we've trained over 18 colleges, about 700 students so far in general mental health awareness. But we're working on an apprenticeship uh, to do with resilience so that when they come into the commercial industry, they're a little bit more you know, uh, perhaps aware of their own emotional intelligence and so that they come in being able to cope with the stresses of, of the normal hospitality industry. And we're continually developing uh, new and innovative ways of looking at this and trying to address the different areas of it. Yeah, massively so. I mean, 
you know, we're, as a non-profit, we're not here to make millions of pounds. There's nothing in it for me as a director other than a basic salary. The key thing for us is that we want to leave a legacy and that we want to make sustainable changes. So by distributing the Burnt Chef support service, and this isn't just for chefs, this is for front of house, back of house, this is for supply chain. You know, if you notice that your delivery driver, because they're under a lot of pressure, the wholesale industry at the moment, if your delivery driver comes in and they're not looking right, they're, you know, they've disclosed that they're not feeling quite right themselves, they can use this number as well. The whole, the whole cycle, anything to do with hospitality can use this number. It's free to distribute. We cover the cost of the service. So that's a good, great first port of call. The Academy, again, there's a lot of resources on there which people can start to access. But if businesses really want to get involved and really start to tackle this, we do work individually with businesses. Not quite on a consultancy basis, but we can do activation. So I can come in and do face-to-face -face training. We can talk at large events as well. And that, again, really helps break down the walls of the stigma, gets people engaged. Um, and also they can purchase the merchandise from the store as well, which again, you know, it tends to open up a lot of conversations. You know, what, what's that about? Like, why is that called the Burnt Chef Project? Starts to open a conversation. And with eight out of 10 professionals within this industry, reported to having saying they've had a mental health issue during their career, there's a lot more people out there who resonate with this message than not. Hundred percent. I mean, I think the key thing at this moment in time is that the subject of mental health is very much at the forefront of, of everyone's conversation. But rather than this be a flash in the pan, this is a sustained conversation. So for any larger businesses out, or even smaller businesses at this moment in time that want to get involved with us, they can support us through fundraising, through donations. They can work with us on an individual basis as well. So we can come in and do training with their teams on mental health awareness and also managing mental health in the workplace. Um, plus the additional modules that we're building at this moment in time. Um, the you know, it, it costs a lot of money to be able to put these services in place and at the moment everything is self-funded. So we're really looking for people who share our vision, want to commit to making this industry healthier and more sustainable long term um, and joining us on this journey really. It's a tricky one. You know, my focus initially a year and a half ago was to take some photos of hospitality professionals, raise a little bit of money locally and provide it to my local Dorset Mind. You know, that, that, was, that was my only goal and I was going to go back to my day job and carry on. So, you know, little did I know that I'd have to quit my job to be able to focus on this full time and we would now have international recognition across the industry and people contacting us from places like Australia, South America, um, Canada, you know, that for me has meant that we've had to pivot and shift quite quickly um, to fit the needs of the, the industry. My key focus is continuing this conversation, is providing more support for the individuals, so bolstering the services that we have in place in terms of counselling, in terms of immediate response services, not just nationally but internationally. There's still a lot of work that needs to be done in certain countries like Australia for example where we get contacted a lot. We are doing a Burnt Chef support service in Canada and America, which will be custom branded so that we can then track the metrics and the data of how many people are using it and what, what for, so that we can get a better insight into what's happening in different parts of the world. Um, but uh, yeah, I think the key thing is to build more training material, make sure that we're bolstering the industry as much as possible, and ultimately ushering in a, ushering in a change. For me personally, I'm very keen on working with more businesses one-on-one -on -one to be able to celebrate the businesses that are doing well um, and look at how, how well they're doing with their retention, what are the key things that are working well for them and being able to help other businesses implement those changes. Um, and that's one of the ways we're doing that is looking at long-term building an accreditation as well so that there'll be certain metrics that we can go in we can look at what the business is doing currently in terms of some of the things I've mentioned today, and then we can help with guidance and training to implement new changes and new structural changes into the business to make sure that that business is starting to change their momentum, if you like. Um, so that, again, is gonna be a key area of focus. A lot of plates spinning, there's a lot going on, but you know, so far we're making a tangible difference to the industry, and so we'll continue to diversify and, and pivot as much as we need to. I think just take a step back and look at things from a slightly different perspective. We are very reactive in this industry. You know, we're always 
you know, service comes, we're dealing with it in the here and the now and the problems that are associated with that. Resource crisis comes, we need people quickly to fill that gap. What we need to do is take a step back. We need to look at our team members. Um, well, in fact, we need to look at ourselves first and just check in with ourselves. Ask ourselves how we're doing. You know, monitor the things in our life. Are we eating right? Are we exercising right? Have we got a good work-life balance? You know, are we taking good care of ourselves? Are we leading by example? Then we need to look at our teams and become more aware of our teams. How are they performing? How are they handling with things on a day-to-day -day basis? Are they struggling in certain areas and they need to be upskilled? Are they just need sometimes, uh, you know, an arm around the shoulder and say, are you okay? Like, would you like to talk about anything? Those are very small things that we can do to start to make changes. And I think as business owners, again, and management teams, we need to start looking at the way that perhaps, not necessarily the way that things have been done before, looking at what the, what the problem is, what our perceived solution is and how things have been done before, but then also how else can we do that? Because there isn't, there's more than one way to skin a cat. And I think that ultimately, if we start looking at things from a slightly different angle, so solving it from problem first, rather than just following the same old frameworks. And I think, again, we can start to make a, a long-term sustainable change. I think at this moment in time, you know, we work with some great partners. Um, you know, there are many people who supply the industry. People like Lamb Weston, for example, have supported since the very early days. You know, they're positioning themselves in the market as a supplier who genuinely cares about the industry and the overall sustained approach of it. I think that any, any business, Chave, any business who's looking at getting involved in the future as well from a supply point of view is a great opportunity to be involved in ushering in a new, new way because ultimately without people who are healthy and happy in the workplace working in an industry that's sustainable long term, we're not going to have the business in order to be able to back it up. So I think that suppliers, by getting involved now, helping us raise money, helping us raise awareness continue conversations and increase the awareness of the fact that we're here to be able to try and support individuals and businesses through this new change it's a great opportunity both from a branding point of view but also actually it makes it's a good thing to do it's a sustainable approach to the industry long term Chris, I just want to start by saying that was an amazing video. Um, thank you for sharing it with everyone. As you probably saw in the chat, a few people were asking if uh, we'd be able to share it with it. And I think the plan is that we're going to share it with everyone that we can so that you can watch it yourself, take some time over it, or indeed share it with your teams, your employees, or your employers. Um, so as you can see, um, Chris Hall, the founder of uh, Burnt Chef Project, is there waving at us. Um, and we're also absolutely delighted to be joined by one of our, our very best chefs and no less uh, Burnt Chef um, Project ambassador, uh, mm. Chef Adam Simmons. Hello, Adam. Hi, how are you? I'm very well. Thank you um, for joining us. No, um, for having me. I, oh, absolute pleasure. I just, for just if anyone um, uh, doesn't know, you've been living under a rock for the last 20 years. Can you? Uh, <laughs> Can you just give us a, like a brief rundown of um, some of the amazing places that you've worked and some of the amazing people that you've worked with, please? Yeah, so I, start, I started at Gavroche when I was 17, 18. I then went to work at a couple of the big hotels in London, the Ritz, um, the Lanesborough. Then I went to America for a little bit. I did a year out there. <clears throat> that was more of a lifestyle change, I think, more than anything. I came back, went back to London for a bit, then went to work at the Manoir. I took my first head chef job at 32 at the Greenway in Cheltenham. From there, I went to Annecy Hall in Wales, where we achieved the star of four rosettes uh, and many other accolades. Left there after three years, came back down south to um, Danesfield House, <coughs> uh, recreated what we got in Wales over a number of years, was there for seven years, left there to open a pop-up that took a little bit longer than I anticipated opened the pop-up uh did that for a year and now i'm looking to do um to take on a role within my own business again in a nutshell so so the, so as you say within your own business now i guess gives you an element of control over what your next kitchen would look like so let's you know let's get straight in there what what is it that you're looking for in terms of the nuts and bolts of the kitchen um 
of course, for exemplary food and service, but also to make sure that your teams are well looked after and yourself is well looked after as well. And I think this is one of the one of the one of the reasons. There's many reasons that are that are, that are up there at the top. Obviously, one of them is staff welfare and making sure that that I can look after the staff and practice what I believe in and what I stand for for the Burnt Chef project. I think it's so important. You know, I've taken jobs where things haven't worked out because of what people have said would happen, change and stuff, and they don't really want change. So now the only way I can do that is to potential, is to get funding for my own business, which is what I'm working for. But within that business, the, the investors need to understand that, you know, an element of it is going to be around staff welfare, you know, it's it's going to be night um sorry 60 percent plant-based food 20 percent uh protein meat fish etc you know it's going to be i want somewhere where it's going to be tranquil for the staff to come you know it's going to be shut three days a week potentially to start with chris and i have spoken about a number of different aspects of of re reducing the hours for staff and making sure they're looked after you know giving them a safe place to be able to speak if they have mental health you know all of these processes that we speak about through the burnt chef project that are so close to me personally also you know it, it's about time and it, you know the change has to come from somewhere and it has to come from the people that are leading you know and hopefully i'm going to be one of those people that can do that absolutely i hope you don't mind me asking and i'm not looking for you to name any names but given your wide uh, your, your, your wide breadth of history across you know different countries and um, and different restaurants and different chefs I, I take it that your experiences as you were you were learning your trade they they weren't always exemplary and not the way that we want practices to be maybe now and certainly when you've got your own kitchens in the future for sure when I started it it was it, you know as we know it was a different era back then I'm not saying it was acceptable but you know what happens is that you that you're going to these kitchens where where you want to learn your profession and uh, you know for whatever reason it, it the, the set i need to be careful as a word is, the situation is that it's not favorable for staff sometimes you know having said that and i've openly admitted you know some of the re well the reason why i involved in the burnt chef project other than i believe in it is that you know change and to stand up for change you know i sometimes in the kitchen some of my behaviors weren't favorable and i've and i've mentioned that and that's not something i'm proud of but we can all change and want to change and i'm one of those people that wants to change and make it a better industry i've been cooking for 32 years and i love it and i wouldn't do anything else but it's about time we stood up and be counted as an as an industry and said no that we need to put a stop to this and we need to make the change in order for it to become one of one of the best industries to work in again and adam um and adam and chris do you feel do you feel like change is already happening do you feel like um you know obviously chris you're speaking to so many operators all the time and so many chefs all the time and adam obviously you're you're, you're there at the, at the at the cold face but do you feel that in the last say five years there has been improvements as an industry overall or are we now um you know or is now the time that we actually have to start from my own personal perspective, I mean, the industry has changed a hell of a lot in the last 10, 10 years uh, and five years. It, it's definitely become uh, more PC, which is right. Um, we are starting to look at employee welfare now as being one of the key components. But I do feel that there's almost there's almost a, a, another stigma at play, which is that many business owners and operators now are looking at the conversations that are happening in the public forum and almost going, oh, we're too late to this party. Like we, you know, we're, we're gonna be left behind and, and it's, we should have started this ages ago. So that almost there's um, a paralysis by analysis, if you like to call it, you know, people are actually going, well, you, we, we might've missed this. But 
the reality of it is, and I'm always continually surprised by businesses who are actually implementing some of the things that we saw on the video and certain discussion points, and they feel that they are, you know, they're, they're way behind loads of other businesses in the industry. But the reality is, is that there's a lot of conversation going on at this moment in time. But there are, are you know, only a, a handful of, of um, businesses that we work with who are actively taking proactive steps to implement new processes and structures. So I think you know whilst i'm quite an impatient guy uh which is why you know, we've worked so tirelessly to be able to get the project to where it is at this moment in time but i think the reality of it is is this conversation is going to be needed for you know five ten fifteen years down the road but you know on the plus side whilst i will continue working and, and adam will work with me as well as all of our other ambassadors who are watching here today will continue to work the more businesses we speak to, the better feel for things that we will we'll have, and we'll be able to implement quicker and faster solutions for operators to focus on the well-being of their teams. Absolutely, and how did you how did you get involved with Bird Chef Project as a as a chef ambassador? So it, it started with the first lockdown. Um, I was scrolling through Instagram as you do when when I suppose I didn't have much to do at that point, and it was like, well, what do I do now? You know, I'd, I'd applied to become a fruit picker in bits and pieces with unsuccessfully. You know, it was a case of doing whatever I could work wise. And I came across the Burnt Chef project and I just reached out to Chris. Um, I, I, I can't remember the conversation, but it was, you know, if if it was it's such a long time ago and a lot's happened since then. But it was, you know, it, I think I was speaking about my own mental health at that point. Um, and I said, if I could help in any way. Then I'd love to be love to get involved, and through dialogue and stuff, we did a uh, we did a uh, a Facebook video, and then from there it's it's grown from it's grown from there. I but think it was, it, was, it, just... it was about it was about wanting to help people. You know, I've had mental health. I've uh, it's no there's no nothing's hidden. You know, I've had addiction problems and stuff like this. So. It was about reaching out and, and smashing the stigma around uh, not being able to talk or, or be afraid to open your mouth with reprisal or whatever the case may be. And it was a case of that, you know, if I would maybe opened my mouth earlier, then I may not have reached the situation that I did. And it was trying to help to say it's OK to talk. Um, and it's just gone from strength to strength, and, you know, the Absolutely. Project, project, so. Yeah. And, it, and, and it is, and it's one of the things actually that I've really um, admire, Chris and Adam, with the Bird Chef project is that is that it is it's so visible. Part of that, of course, is that you've done such great work with the, with the merchandising, with the brand, with the with the with the logos there, and um, <laughs> and, um, and 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 how are you finding that? You know, through the merchandising and through you know modern channels of social that that is allowing people, you know, social. We all know when we think of sport and things like that, uh, and of course restaurants as well to a certain extent, can be not always a channel for good. Um, but actually, things like this with mental health and the Burnt Chef Project, actually, it's very much a window and an, op and an opening to getting help or getting involved. Can you, can you tell us a bit of, of what you've done with that? Yeah, I mean, uh, as I've, I've said to, on many interviews before, I. I'm a wolf in sheep's clothing, so I am not. I wouldn't be able to last. Uh, certainly not now. I wouldn't be able to last a, a you know twelve-hour session in the kitchen. I just I wouldn't be able to do it. You know, my days as a bar manager, uh, 12, 13, 14 hours serving bar four four deep was was quite quite enough for me. But my background's in sales and marketing, and for a long time, you know, just the the whole journey that I've been on in terms of being able to smash stigma because mental health isn't something you talked about i just wanted to turn that on its head and go actually do you know what it is cool like it is all right to talk about it wear some merchandise with pride and let people know that you are open to having a discussion about something that every single person on this planet has and let's make it cool let's make it acceptable to talk about it whether that's in a business environment or with your friends or family and do you know what wear it with pride because ultimately you know, this is this is saving lives. You know, let's let's without getting over dramatic, the more people that can open a conversation, can actively listen, can feel comfortable enough in a safe environment to be able to 
to put into words for the first time something they've never been able to say before could not just make a difference to someone's life, it could save someone's life. And I feel so passionate about that being the case. That is my fire. I, I just need for people to understand that it's all right to talk about it. And, you know, it, that's, yeah, the, uh, the merchandise certainly helps with the, the opening those conversations. So I, I was wearing some of the merchandise, um, must have been about two months ago, six weeks ago, and somebody stopped me and asked me what it was about. Just completely, I, I had the hoodie on, and it was just like, what's that all about? And it was just, it was, you know, it's like I, I was almost stopped in my tracks because I wasn't expecting it. For some reason, I wasn't expecting it. I don't know why. And the conversation must have gone on for about 10 minutes. So it's one That's person reached in the street already, you know, and how many more, yeah. how many more can you reach, you know? So I, had a curry with a friend on, I had a curry with a friend on Friday night, and I, and I was wearing... Was wearing was wearing this. I promise I've watched this, isn't it? But uh, and um, and he j he asked me what it was, and and he, you know he doesn't he doesn't work in hospitality, but it opened up a conversation about mental health and anxiety and, and things like that. And actually, he actually wanted to know, oh my gosh, like is there something I could do to help or be involved? Even though he doesn't work in hospitality, everyone's got certain skills, and when they find something that connects to them. You know the people people want to be want to be involved i hope you don't yeah. mind i want to go the, you, some of this has been happening in the in the chat while we've been here but we got a, we got a question quite early on um and i think give, giving out some real practical advice so not meaning to go over what's going on in in the chat but certainly um someone who's kind enough to join us today said what's the best way to deal with a bad day now we all have bad days um but if we can give out some ad advice that is tangible advice that helps people, helps all of us, then let's do it. Um, Adam, Chris, what's your tips for dealing with a bad day? I think, I think, <laughs> yeah. well, Adam, Adam, well, Adam and I have spoken about this many a time. I think for me, the most powerful one, if I had to just give one and I'll let Adam take over after this is just acknowledge that you're having a bad day. Like the first and foremost, you know, is just be like, okay, it's a day. And it is, you know, it's not gone according to plan, but what's next? How do I reset from this? What are the next steps? And Adam, I think perhaps you can you can talk about what works well for you, because I know that you've, you've successfully implemented quite a few changes, haven't you? Yeah, I, I think, I think on a, be kind to yourself. Everybody has bad days, you know, it don't beat yourself up about it. You know, I used to be really bad at, you know, a bad day, it used to be like the world was coming to an end. Um, then really, you know, I try and turn it on its head now and think, okay, like Chris has said, um, that, you, you know, I talk to people about it. <clears throat> I'm, there's no shame. I speak to the team about it. You know, if I'm, if I'm having a bad day, I'll, I'll acknowledge that to the team and say, I'm having a bad day today. I'm only human. And that's, you know, it's accept that's okay to do that. Um, I, I talk to people. I, I go for a walk. I try and clear my head take a step away from the building all of these things rather than just trying to fight through it you know go for a walk listen to uh i listen to audio books now you know about positive thinking just to change my mindset you know and it's all about trying to change your mindset from thinking oh my word my word the world's going to end to a certain degree to thinking well it take it as a positive you learn you learn more from having a bad day than you would do from a good day but it also if you are really struggling you know, talking to somebody or, or texting the, the text-based service from the burnt chef, was it? Yeah, and I think like it's important to recognise that we, especially if you have something like depression, for example, and you are in rumination phase, so if you are in the worry loop, it is very, it's, it's you know, it can be difficult to get out of that negative, negative way of thinking because our, our body, our brain physically changes. You know, again, this the whole stigma around mental health is it's all in your head, but actually, no, you it physically changes, and as a, res a byproduct of that, negative thinking is is something that we do experience with mental illness. But I think you know, as Adam says, it's about saying it's all right. You know, I can let myself feel like this for a little bit, but what am I going to do? How am I going to distract myself? Using mindfulness, you know, using things like Headspace as a meditation app is fantastic couple of minutes of that should be able to 
start to get you into the right sort of flow. But again, you know, it's called mindfulness practice for a reason is because it takes years. You never master it because it is always something that you're practicing. But it just, you know, it's a good it's a good tool. It's a good technique for, uh, for mental hygiene, which is something that we don't often speak about, uh, certainly, at, you know, younger ages now. Taking big, deep breaths is also something else, that, you know, that, I, that, I, that works for me also. And yeah, what, yeah, or journaling. And well. what if you feel like you haven't got anyone to talk to? What can the Burn Chef project offer at, at, at that point? I know there's the tech service, um, but it'd be worth just reiterating now that we're live with everyone. Yeah, so we've got, uh, well, we've got two services. We've got the Burnt Chef support service, which is a free 24-hour text-based support service available to anyone in the UK. Uh, that you can just text Burnt Chef, which is all one word, capital letters, to 85258, and a trained volunteer will text you back within just five minutes. You'll get an automated response first, but then literally within a couple of minutes, you'll have a, a response from a real-life human being who you can talk to securely, confidently, uh, without you know, without fear of stigma or shame, uh, we're very lucky to work with a, a fantastic charity called the Drinks Trust, who um, look after you know the on trade, and they've they've got a, a helpline that they've also extended to cover us, which is also available to people in Ireland uh, using an 0800 number. That also then also extends to managerial help, uh, help for a whole host of other matters. We had someone contact us recently, a manager who um, had a member of their team that they were experiencing difficulties. And she used the service to be able to get access for help and, and guidance on what to do next. So it really is, you know, there 24 hours a day. The ambassador scheme, we are well underway. Uh, Adam is one of our chief ambassadors. We've got a number of chief ambassadors based around the world at this moment in time. Uh, but our ambassador scheme is we're working diligently to ensure that it's a rigid peer support network. So what that means is that you'll be able to actually contact our ambassadors. They're not gonna be available 24 hours a day, but through shared, <laughs> through shared experience, I see Adam laughing. You know, it's important to have be, be able to have you know multilingual ambassadors in all sides of the world who can engage with you and and can show empathy and show that they understand from from being in the in the industry whether that's you're working in hr for hospitality whether you're a qualified life coach or if you're you know a chef or a waiter waitress whatever it might be you know it's important that you can actually have a, a meaningful conversation with someone who may have been through something similar or may understand and that in itself uh, has proved massive. I mean, just people who text in, 92% of people who've used the Burnt Chef support service say that they feel better after having a conversation with someone. So, you know, never underestimate the power of that. But uh, we are, we're, I'm going to continue working my socks off until we have got this absolutely nailed. And then we have other sectors looking at us and going, okay, we should we should be following this lead now. Great answer. I think um, we're getting a few questions coming in now on the on the chat, and we're going to get through um, as many as we can. Um, if there's anything, of course, that we can't get through today, um, if you uh, email info at burntchefproject.com, um, they're also on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook. If you go to www.burntchefproject.com, there's lots and lots of amazing resources there. A really good question for, for, for uh, from Jimmy. Um, Chris, what's in the pipeline for Burnt Chef Project? Uh, so I've mentioned a few things. The peer support network uh, we are we're we're working on. Uh, you know, I'm I'm aiming ultimately the next stage for that would be for our chief ambassadors or our ambassador network to host regular weekly catch up catch ups. You know, if we've got the best part of well, we've already got over fifty ambassadors currently. We'll make sure that they're fully trained in safeguarding, in peer support techniques and mental health first aid. And then we'll host weekly catch ups for people to be able to drop in in a group format and a confidential group format and be able to talk and openly discuss and feel like they're part of something uh, whereby they're not going to get any stigma or shame thrown their way. So that's the first thing that we're working on. I suspect we'll have that ready to go in the next two to three months. Moving forward with that, uh, we are applying at this moment for grants to get some funding so that we can train college lecturers in mental health first aid. My aim is to get 36 trained over the next 12 months so that they can better aid the younger generation that are coming through the catering colleges at this moment in time. 
as well as that, uh, Adam doesn't know this yet, but uh, Adam will be involved as well as a few of other our, of our ambassadors in more college talks uh, to do with problem solving, personal resilience, self care techniques. Yeah, you know, we really want to be hitting 25, 30 catering colleges throughout 2022 so that the future of our generation and our profession are fully or at least trained more than we were when we entered uh, entered the working world on this subject matter so that they can hit the ground running uh, and start to develop their own cultures and have a hospitality industry that they can call their own. I think on two, on two, 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 things, sorry, sorry, on two things there. <laughs> the colleges it's so important that that we can go into the colleges and teach them and you know to, or, or talk about it because that's the next generation as chris said um and and the change is gonna although it started now it's going to be a massive shift when they start to come in and, and get bigger positions and on the second thing you know trust of speaking in a in a group or or to somebody where you find that you can have trust because trust is so important and a safe place where you can go and talk and I think that's, you know, I can't reiterate that enough. If you need to talk to somebody that, that it is, you feel safe and secure, that you know something's not gonna be spoken about out of, out of that circle. Next question we've got here is, a, is, is an interesting question, definitely. How do you feel about naming businesses with bad practices if you can see that there is a problem as staff retention is horrendous? Um, it's not going to be the answer that everyone in likes, but I don't agree with it. And the reason why I don't agree with that is if we continue to burn down an industry that's already on flames, what space are you going to give to those who perhaps have perhaps have an opportunity to change their practices? It may not necessarily be within the time scales that we want them to be. Certainly if we're in those environments ourselves and they're damaging to us, but people should feel empowered enough, A, to speak out, B, to also be able to leave because there are employers out there now who would take this as a serious matter. But ultimately, if we continue to shame and cancel culture organizations and individuals who have bad practices, then they're never going to get any better. We're reinforcing those behaviors. And ultimately, you know, we the Burn Chef Project has built a good following, uh, a good message through training, support, education. For those who are still running bad practices in two or three years time, they're gonna be left out in the cold. And what will happen is you will find the good businesses who are focusing on this as a primary, uh, primary means of running a, an organization and a business won't struggle for recruitment. They won't have to worry about advertising for staff because ultimately it'll be a place where people want to work and those businesses with bad practices will be left out in the cold, ultimately. Absolutely. It's a competitive market out there. And the people that aren't looking after their teams won't have the people to look after, perhaps, in a, in a, in a few years if everyone's doing it right. Really good question just uh, came in on my phone uh, and I think probably on the screen as well. Any advice on how to encourage an employer to take this more seriously and, uh, and, and look into the Burnt Chef project? And a question for me alongside that, um, kind of with the with the question before is is if you feel that your company isn't behaving the best uh, that it could could be can can the individual approach you Chris to go to that company or is that or how how could that work yeah it's a it's, it's a good one if I'm completely honest with you I don't know what the correct answer for that would be we have had people who you know, have spoken to us about their own problems with certain certain companies. Um, and often enough, you know, there have been occasions where I have had conversations with business owners to get the full story. But I think from a, an employee's point of view, the first thing to do, rather than just assume that the company has no processes or procedures in place, ask. Because it might be that they have, they have them in place, but they just haven't advertised them. They haven't reviewed them recently. They haven't, you know, made them common knowledge you know many organizations out there at this moment in time have an eap system in place which provides you with free legal advice and mental health advice but people don't tend to say about them you know once they're in place they're in the handbook and that's it you go you go on through your probation period and you continue to work so i think the first thing is speak to your leadership team ask them what what procedures what policies they have with regards to this subject matter 
it's always easier to be able to get someone's engagement if you're asking the questions from a position of care and support rather than throwing accusations around. Um, because what that would also do is it'll get people on site they can ask you why you're asking that, and then you can also then send them over to the Burnt Chef project, and we can have a conversation. But I think, think the key thing is, you know, you can't strong arm someone into <coughs> having uh, this this conversation now. People are going to work at their own times. Uh, they're going to have their own priorities that they're going to be focusing on. So, you know, softly, softly, uh, the voice of the Burnt Chef project is growing daily. We're getting great support from people like Sharbe at this moment in time as well. And you know, all roads will start to point back to us as, as one of the sort of leaders in this field to try and help you know, raise awareness and, and provide the right supportive measures to improve company cultures. So you know, if, if at this moment in time it's of damage to you and you feel that you are being compromised, then yes, certainly raise it. But also I think sometimes we can be guilty in the working world feeling like we have no other choice but to stay there and stay through this but we work in the third largest sector that employs 3.2 million people especially now at this moment in time there are a lot of vacancies for businesses who are starting to make the right changes and do things that are supportive and we work with a couple of them who uh, go out of their way to ensure that their teams are well looked after so they do exist excellent i think uh, unless anyone's got any more questions, we're kind of coming to the end uh, end of our time today, which is such a shame, but it's really important to know that these resources are out there all year round um, at burntchefproject.com or info at burntchefproject.com. Uh, There's so many resources, whether you want to donate or buy a hoodie or you want to share those links with your friends or you want to use them yourselves, please go and look at um, and look at these great um, these great resources that are there for this this great project um all that i need to do now is obviously say a massive thank you to chef adam simmons thank you very much thank you so um, much great chef ambassador and uh, and for joining us today and of course to the founder uh, to mr chris hall um and most of all thank you to all of uh, all of you that have joined us um and to our friends at Chave as well um i hope our paths all uh, meet again soon and um until then stay safe stay well everyone um, and have a good day. Thanks, Thank everyone. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye-bye. Cheers. Bye-bye.